Hello and good afternoon here at Ars Electronica Home Delivery from Deep Space 8K. My name is Sandra and I'm going to present to you one of the most mysterious items from history we've known so far <laughs> here in Deep Space. Uh, we are talking about the Voynich Manuscript. So this manuscript defies explanation. It defies definitions and decoding measures and it has done so for the past hundred years and we're still not really close to solving it. But to get you an idea of what the Voynich manuscript is and how it looks like, before we're going to go deeper into it, I want to show you a little trailer we have from one of the many documentaries that exist about this manuscript. It's in German, but I will tell you a little bit what it is, and it's mostly just for getting the impression of what this book is, how it looks and how it, how it has fascinated researchers and um, hobby they are cryptologists alike. So enjoy the trailer first and then we're going to take a detailed look here in high resolution in deep space of the script itself. Ob getarnte Kriegsberichte, vertrauliche Liebesbotschaften oder verbotenes Wissen. So it's about the history of cryptology in general. We've always been fascinated by it, of encrypting messages. But we've also been able to solve a lot of them already. But not the Voynich manuscript. We were not able to solve that yet. Das Voynich manuscript. Es ist das mysteriöseste Buch der Welt, verfasst von einem unbekannten Autor in einer völlig einzigartigen Schrift. So the most mysterious book in the world. We don't even know who the author is. Welches Geheimnis ist zwischen diesen Zeilen verborgen? So which secrets lay between the lines of the manuscript that we still don't know of? Ein Forscher will jetzt dieses Rätsel lösen. Zu diesem Zweck wird das Voynich Manuskript erstmals mit materialwissenschaftlichen Methoden untersucht. So there are many different methods on how to analyze this book. Liegt der Schlüssel zum Voynich Rätsel. So there was the short trailer for the Voynich Manuscript for the Voynich Mystery. Uh, you can find this documentary actually on YouTube. It's about uh, three quarters of an hour and there are many, many more. This one is in German. There are some in German and a lot of in English as well. Sometimes even taking an hour or two even. I try not to take that long, but there's a lot to talk about with this fascinating manuscript. So we're going to switch over now from this trailer to the actual script itself. As I said, countless researchers have tried to decode this book and with the help of modern technology, we could even uh, take a look from very far away from where the actual book is stored. And we have high resolution photographs, so-called gigapixel photo photographs of some pages of the script. There they are. So we're going to take a look. First of all, you cannot see that much from this perspective. But we can zoom in, we can get closer. Oh, hopefully also to this corner around here, we'll see. First of all, let's take a look at some of the pages and then I'm going to tell you what makes this script so special. What's, what is it all about? The Voynich manuscript gives us something to think about. It has done so for the past hundred years and more. So even the crypt uh, cryptographers from the First and Second World War were not able to crack it. But they have by no means been the first to try to do that. This book um, was long believed to have existed around the time of Roger Bacon. So one universal genius, you could say, who did a lot when it comes to coding and writing down empirical research. So Roger Bacon lived in the 13th century. And many believed that it was his work, even though we don't know why he did it the way he, uh, he drew it. But now we can say for certain it was not Roger Bacon who wrote it. Also not John Dee, another important historical figure, the 
alchemist and advisor of Queen Elizabeth I of England. John Dee believed it was written by Roger Bacon and uh, had it amongst his collection, which he inherited from him. So John Dee lived in the 16th century and later scholars believed he might have wrote the, uh, written the manuscript. Again, this theory lived on for quite a while, but it was disputed not so long ago. The trailer for the documentary you saw was done, uh, the documentary was from 2015, where carbon dating happened from the first time from four different pages of this manuscript. And we can now say for certain that it was produced at the beginning of the 15th century. So neither John Dee nor Roger Bacon are uh, actually candidates for being the author of this manuscript because the one lived too early, the other one too late. But we still don't know who wrote it. We know it was written on calfskin and it was one complete volume containing 116 pages. Now a few are lost, we, we still have 102 pages left and we know that um, one person wrote it and another person drew the pictures, the images we see, and there might have been even a second or third author. We don't know for sure that the complete codex was written by one person. Makes it a, lit mis uh, a lot mysterious as well to not even know who wrote it and where it came from. That's another question is uh, its origin. We know the year now approximately when it was written, but where it was written is another mystery. So we have to go over here to one of the drawings from the book to have a guess like where it could have originated from, especially this section here. So what we have here, you have to imagine it like turned uh, the other way, is actually a castle. In the list we can recognize the shapes of a castle and for example the wall is very typical for the late um, Italian um, style of building you could say in the beginning of the 15th century. So the place of origin might as well have been Italy, but we cannot say for sure. Then the book gets even more mysterious because the drawings um, are quite stylish. They are done with accuracy and a lot of colors, but we don't know what they mean. We have no idea what this uh, circle should be, what the star should be, but there are theories. There are different sections of the book and one is dedicated to astronomy and astrology, so it might have something to do with the zodiac signs or the stars on the firmament. Another section that's even uh, more beautiful to look at is the botanical section. That's this one here. So we assume that this text here describes the plant you see here, but neither do we know the plant, nor do we know the script, what it actually says. So there are some letters that look familiar, for example, an A here or an O. But some others, like for example this one, are completely unique and we have no idea what they say. But most scholars agree that it is a language, indeed, because there are clear spaces between the words. We have sentence structures and even paragraph structures. And some letters appear again and again, so it's also not random. We know there is a certain pattern to all those to all those structures. And also the plant, if we want to have a look at it, it looks a little bit maybe like a plant we know today, but again, even if it looks similar, which not all of them do, there are some things that are baffling. We don't know, for example, certain characteristics, where they come from, and also not uh, why they are drawn that way. And some, so sometimes we even think they might not be real, they might be like a dream of an alchemist. But like I said, that's only speculation. One more interesting part of this manuscript is the last one. We have a page from this over here. That's the so-called recipe section. So we believe that actually the recipes are with um, ingredients that we have the amounts for, but we cannot uh, know which recipe it is, what it was used for. But it was very detailed, very... Um, carefully written and laid out. That's one theory actually that it was written by a, um, a doctor, by an expert in medicine to keep his trade secrets. Uh, but for example, he could have written down important recipes of his time. It's one theory. Like I said, we, we don't know much more beyond that because it could just very well be the work 
of a coven of witches, that's another theory that have uh, written down their practices. What gives this theory a little bit of power are those images. You see them all the time in the manuscript. Bathing women. Most of them appear to be pregnant even, so they are, uh, they are depicted naked and also often swimming, as I said, in a strange green liquid. We don't know what that is. It could be a biological process, a chemical process, it could be more philosophical, like the connection between nature and uh, humankind. We don't know, we can only guess. Another theory says it's the work of a professional jokester, that it was all done just because you wanted to get money of a rich uh, noble, for example, and sell it as like a mysterious uh, new novel, a new idea, mysterious riddles all across the pages. But we don't know for sure who wrote it. We just know who did not write it, because like I said, the timeline don't, that doesn't match up. What we do know is, uh, like I said, it originated in the 15th century. Then there is a short break where we don't know what happened to the manuscript. And once again, um, we know through letters, through certain conversations, that the book was indeed traded to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II at the turn of the 16th century. So we know it was in his possession, but uh, not for very long. Then he gave it to one of his advisors, Jacobi de Temet, <laughs> um, the name is hard to pronounce, uh, Temetic, I think. And he indeed was trying to figure out what this manuscript said, and he was very proud to have it, as you can see in his signature, which is only visible under UV light, though. Tepenet is his name, I'm sorry. So he signed the book, trying to decode its secrets, but he failed. And after giving up on this mysterious manuscript, he in turn inherited it to one of his colleagues called uh, Marcus Marcy. And he also tried to solve it with no, um, no success. And Marcy then in turn tried to convince Athanasius Kircher, one of the universal geniuses of their time, to have a look. But Kircher was not interested. He uh, did not want to see it. He had enough on his plate already. Well, after um, Marcy, we know that the book was passed on to several different hands. We don't know to whom exactly, but somehow it ended up uh, in the Jesuit library in Italy. So maybe the origin was Italy, as we said before, then it traded hands to uh, the Czech Republic, France, and maybe then we don't know in between what happened, but it came back to Italy. And the Jesuits had uh, quite a substantial library to at their disposal and they added it. But there it lay forgotten for quite some time until the problems um, between the Jesuits and the Pope arose anew, like the Catholic Church conflict. They wanted to confiscate their books, their works. And around 1912, this conflict escalated and uh, the Jesuits came up with a loophole in the new edict um, from the Catholic Church that all public libraries are the church's property. So they handed it out to private individuals. And in this process, in 1912, is where the namesake, the giver of the Voynich manuscript's name comes into play, Wilfred Voynich. He heard of the struggles somehow, we don't know how exactly, and purchased the book along with several other manuscripts from the Jesuits to add to his own collection. He was a bookseller and a seller of rare antiquities. Yeah, so he also tried to study this incredible book, this incredible manuscript, but as so many before him, failed to uh, solve the riddle that is the book and also to give us an insight into the secrets. But he tried for a long time, actually almost until his death. Then it, um, the book was given to his, uh, to his wife, Ethel Voynich, and her private assistant, Anne Nill. They claimed ownership until uh, 1969, when it was sold to an Austrian bookseller and businessman, um, Hans Kraus. And he then indeed tried to solve the book again for several years, but he gave up. And then it was given to the University of Yale in their library of rare manuscripts and 
writings. And it has remained there ever since. The original is not for public viewing anymore. It has never left Yale except once for a world tour to London. And, but there are copies and high resolution photographs as we have here so that everyone, uh, like a hobby a cryptologist or a professional scientist can take a look and try to decipher it. Many have tried, as I said before, even during both world wars, the cryptographers of the last century, the very best of their kind, failed. And there have even been attempts to decode it again and again. Some claims that it actually worked, but they were quickly disputed because no one can actually uh, convincingly prove what is written here. If you want to have a go, maybe you will be the one to crack it. I dreamt about, uh, about it once that I was the one to decipher the Voynich manuscript. Yeah, and it's uh, actually, it continues to fascinate us, to baffle us, and not just us um, normal people, I would say, even authors and creators of various um, cultural items, I would say, are interested by it, but the authors are the most dominant kind. I can give you several examples of books which use the Voynich manuscript as one or more of their plot points. For example, uh, the Indiana Jones novels from the 90s, uh, there's one called the uh, Indiana Jones and the Philosopher's Stone, has the Voynich manuscript as one of their plot points. Or uh, Deborah Harkness, a contemporary writer, used it for her All Souls trilogy, dealing about witches, where the Voynich manuscript was their source of knowledge. And another interesting connection is with the work of H.P. Lovecraft, which some of you might, kn might know as the creator of the mythos around Cthulhu. And countless others have enriched this mythos. And one such author was Colin Wilson, and he wrote that, um, in his fictional work, of course, that the Voynich manuscript is an incomplete copy of the Necronomicon. So the Necronomicon is their main book, their Bible, so to say, their devilish Bible of how to conjure demons, and the Voynich manuscript was an attempt to copy this. Of course, it's fiction, we don't know. I, I don't think it was demons, I think it was more medicine, but it's interesting nonetheless. And if you're not that big a fan of reading, there are also, for example, computer game developers who thought the Voynich manuscript can be useful for their games. The Assassin's Creed series, for example, is a good um, example for this. Assassin's Creed 4 and Assassin's Creed Rogue both have the Voynich manuscript in their plots. For the second one, for Rogue, it's actually a very vital point in the story. And also a composer from Switzerland, um, Hans Peter, um, that's the name, Hans-Peter Kiburz, also an interesting one, also took this book uh, in another direction. He wrote a music piece using all the symbols as music notes. So it has inspired countless people over time, over time, and it will only generate more interest as long as we are not able to solve it. In the last few years, attempts have been made to even use artificial intelligence, AI systems, to decode it, up until now, to no avail. So the AI system was given a specific language to work with, the EVA, EVA Hand 1 computer language, based on the EVA, that's a, the European alphabet for the Voynich manuscript, composed by many scientists. So it was digitalized to have something for the AI to work with, but even the AI systems, the very standard modern up-to-date ones were not able to crack the code yet. So we'll see what will come of it, and uh, maybe we can solve it one day until all we can do is guess. Was it aliens? Was it an alchemist from the Middle Ages? Was it witches or something else entirely? Maybe we'll never know, but hopefully we will crack the code sometimes, and if not, it's still one of life's greatest mysteries, one of history's greatest greatest mysteries, and it's still very interesting to have a detailed look at it. Thank you for joining in today. I hope um, I could get you to maybe watch some more detailed uh, documentaries about this interesting manuscript, and see you soon again here at Ars Electronica Home Delivery. Goodbye and have a nice afternoon. <laughs>